This module provides an overview of a risk-based framework for COVID-19 control. First, we need to understand the difference between hazard and risk. Hazard is an inherent property of an agent, so in this case, SARS-CoV-2, that has the potential to cause adverse effect when an organism ex is exposed to that agent. A risk, on the other hand, is the probability of an adverse effect in an organism if it is exposed to that agent. So in our case, a risk might be the likelihood of getting sick if you sneezed on by a COVID-19 case within two feet from you. And that risk can be quantified. It might be one in a hundred, one in a thousand that you get COVID-19. Why does it matter? It matters because nothing is zero risk. And with COVID-19 during the pandemic being so common, being found in so many different places, one cannot manage the hazard. One needs to focus on the areas of highest risk. So COVID-19 control needs to be risk-based. As a hazard-based control would essentially mean that we have to address anything where SARS-CoV-2, the hazard, is found. Risk-based means that we focus on those areas where successful transmission to a human is reasonably likely and where the highest risk of human disease occurring. This illustrates that there truly is nothing such as zero risk. It's just extremely small risk. You can get struck by lightning even indoors. Does that mean it's a risk you won't need to manage? No, because it's extremely unlikely. You do not need to go in your basement when there's a thunderstorm outside, and you would typically not do that. But it still is not zero risk. So why should we not address any risk, no matter how small it is? Number one is because we can. We don't have the resources. There are no unlimited resources, whether it's time, money, or other resources. In addition, we cannot manage every risk, no matter how small it is, because there are unintended consequences. We try to manage a very, very low risk. The process of managing it might create more problems than it addresses. Let's take this into reality of COVID-19. One thing we have learned is that contaminated source surfaces, particularly outside of a hospital, have not been identified as a mode of transmission. Also, no food-related cases have been identified so far. Yes, we had some unsubstantiated report from China that sort of implied that foodborne transmission may have occurred, but outside the group that reported those cases, you find very few of any experts that trust this and see it as sufficient evidence. So epidemiology and biology support the transmission by contaminated surfaces and food represents a negligible risk. This is not just my opinion. Here's an article that was published that also illustrates and supports this. And it's very specific. It points out that none of the studies that we have seen um, are akin, represent real life situation and a more balanced perspective with regard to transmission via surfaces is needed to curb excesses that become counterproductive. And does that mean excesses in controlling a risk that is essentially nil, but not really nil, just very low. So what does this really mean? Where do we, where can we see management of a risk that is so low that the negative consequences outweigh the benefits? Cleaning, sanitizing food and food packaging by individuals at home is one example that is well documented. Here you can see the number of poison control calls um, that occurred after we had unsubstantiated and not appropriate advice to clean and disinfect food before you bring it into your house. The poison control call for cleaner exposure and disinfectant exposure went up. Here's a specific tangible example. A woman heard the news to clean purchase groceries before consuming them. She did this with a mixture of bleach, vinegar, and hot water, got a chlorine smell, difficulty breathing, had to call 911 and be transported to the hospital. 
she managed a risk that is extremely low. What she got for it is exposure to a risk that is much higher. Number one, lung damage. And number two, a trip to the hospital, time in the hospital, where she risked a higher likelihood of exposure to COVID-19 than through food or food packaging. So clearly the unintended consequences of cleaning and sanitizing food outweigh the benefits because we're managing an extremely low negligible risk. This does not mean that surface and food pose no or zero risk for COVID-19 transmission, but that risk is so low, so small that it does not require active management. Now, many of you when they hear that may say, but isn't it better to be safe than sorry? And as we said before, not necessarily as unintended consequences can outweigh the benefits when we try to manage these negligible risks. This also applies in the food industry. One example is if we use excessive resources to sanitize surfaces, to manage a risk that is extremely low, we take away resources that may be better deployed with better impact, for example, to verify mask wearing and social distancing. What are some other unintended consequences of COVID-19 responses? We can come up and see unintended consequences with regard to non-COVID-19 related public health risks. For example, some responses to COVID-19 may imply that food safety strategies or drastic classical food safety hazards have been overemphasized and therefore increase the risk of food safety issues. If we do reduced inspections and audits, then that might imply to staff and maybe even leadership that we've done too much before and that these are not really necessary to assure safe food. If we sanitize frequently touched surfaces without prior cleaning, we imply that cleaning before sanitation is not important, and we might see less compliance with that when we sanitize surfaces in our food processing facility. We may have started to do less testing, and that might imply that testing is not important for food safety, and we may end up with less testing after COVID-19. All of these increase a real hazard food safety risks because we were trying to manage an extremely low risk. or managing risk without completely considering unintended consequences. Now, many of the unintended consequences occur because of human behavior. And some of you may think, I have no real leg to stand on that these unintended consequences happen. I offer you to you this study, which gave groups of people sunscreen. And these were people that went on a summer holiday and they either be were given SPF 10 or a stronger SPF 30 sunscreen. This would obviously manage the risk of sun exposure and therefore the associated skin cancer risk. Now, what happened is really interesting. The individuals that had the higher SPF sunscreen increased the time they spent in sun, therefore essentially offsetting the benefits of the higher SPF sunscreen. So human behavior in response to interventions and control strategies can offset the benefits and sometimes even lead to behavior that outweighs the benefit. For example, if someone would stay in the sun longer than the enhanced protection offered by a higher SPF sunscreen. However, and this is important, there are situations where we will need to manage not just public health risks, but also extremely small risks that where management does not provide a tangible public health benefits because some of these issues may represent business risks. And we also need to manage business risks. Transmission of COVID-19 through foods may be such a risk. Public health risks associated with that, extremely low. No management needed. However, the business risk might be high. If food from a given company might be identified as being positive for COVID-19 DNA, that may shut down export markets and might have a significant negative impact on the enterprise, on the business. Therefore, we may need to decide to put certain 
precautions in place to manage that risk. Examples of other enterprise risks associated with COVID-19 include loss of customers and export markets as detailed before, loss of workforce. If we don't implement certain strategies that our workforce think are important, even though factually the risk is extremely low, we may still have to implement them simply to make sure people come to work. If we don't implement strategies that public health agencies may think are important, we may increase the risk of shutdown when we have a case. We might therefore implement strategies that you know, have limited impact on public health and don't manage a real public health risk to reduce that business risk. How do we reduce business risk? How do we address them? Often it starts with communicating on the control strategies that we have implemented to show that other ones that are required, requested, may not be needed. Sometimes we may have to implement high profile control strategies that don't address a true public health risk, but provide positive publicity and address an enterprise risk. This can be dangerous as it sets expectations going forward. And I will illustrate that as an example. When we do this, when we do prioritization, of control strategies, we therefore need to consider both public health and business risk, as well as unintended consequences. This is a chart that, prior, that we put together that prioritized intervention strategies as we see it. Any business at any time may change that list of priorities and may change what's priority number one, depending on changes in risk, changes on external circumstances, the relative importance of public health and business risks at any time. So risk-based strategies are not static. They require constant reevaluation of risks, particularly in the case of COVID-19, where many things rapidly change, such as frequency of disease, occurrence of new variants, implementation of vaccination, and changes in surveillance systems in but potentially export countries as we have seen. What if our customers, employees, and regulatory agencies require control strategies that are not risk-based? You need to assess the request. The strategy that the request may not address a public health risk, but may in reality address a business risk. They may address a business risk if they ask you, make sure put into place strategies to reduce the risk of packaging being contaminated. You know, an initial answer might be, that's not an important transmission pathway. But upon a second look, one might decide that having virus particles, having virus DNA on a packaging may be a big enough business risk that it actually is worth managing. Understand why that request for hazard-based control occurs reassess your prioritization, reassess whether you should manage this hazard, which is extremely low because maybe it represents a business risk and communicate, communicate, communicate what you're doing, why you're doing something and why you want to elect to not do something that is requested. Here's an example of setting precedent. Early on in this pandemic, we heard many news about extended survival of virus in surfaces, particularly with cases in cruise ships where we heard about the virus being found. And in reality, it was the virus DNA, the virus nucleic acid. It's an RNA virus and not the DNA, the virus RNA, for 70 days after cabins were vacated. We also heard about processing facilities shutting down for 14 days for deep cleaning. All of that set the precedent and implied that surfaces are an important route of transmission. Therefore, if now we scale down surface sanitation, many may see that as us increasing the risk of transmission because we set those precedents when we did not have sufficient information. Acknowledging that, explaining that might go a long way to reduce the pressure to implement some of these hazard-based controls and able 
and gain freedom to focus on the true public health risks and the two public health relevant transmission pathways. So what are the take home messages for industry? Make sure your COVID-19 control strategies are risk-based. Consider both the public health and the business risks. Reevaluate regularly. The knowledge is changing and the risks are changing. In a pandemic with so many changes, so many moving parts, that is, occurs much, much more quickly than with traditional food safety risk. The risk can be changing with changes in numbers of cases, changes in the variants that circulate, increased vaccination, and so on. For all interventions, try to assess unintended consequences to make sure all control strategies have a net benefit on reducing business and public health risks. 